When I'm treating a patient with mycosis fungoides, known as MF, or the Sesame syndrome, I have a systematic way of evaluating those patients for response to treatment because the disease itself involves multiple compartments. The skin, of course, is the most obvious compartment of the disease. My assessment of the skin is based on visual examination to identify patches, plaques, and tumors, and to look at the degree of distribution of those throughout the body surface area. I document this visual assessment by uploading pictures to our electronic medical record system. This way, I can sit down with a patient and show them where they started and where they are today. The MSWAT is a tool most often used in clinical trials that quantitates the amount of skin involvement in each of the regions of the body. MSWAT can be compared from one point in the treatment to another to assess how the skin is doing. Of course, it's also important to listen to the patient and to take into account how they feel they're doing and to ask them to point out areas of improvement or worsening. Blood testing is also important, not only at the diagnosis, but throughout the course of treatment to monitor disease burden in the blood, as well as the response to treatment. Flow cytometry is what we most often use for measuring sesame cells or circulating tumor cells. You can look at the total number of circulating cells by following the white blood cell count, as well as the absolute lymphocyte count. Then you can compare the flow cytometry results over time to see if there was an increase or a decrease in the overall disease burden. Patients with more advanced mycosis fungoides, and certainly those patients with the Cesare syndrome, require a higher level of care because these patients are more susceptible to infections and need to be carefully screened for involvement of other organs. For lymph nodal or visceral involvement, we oftentimes repeat PET-CT imaging. We look at the size of the lymph nodes as well as the FDG uptake of the nodes to compare from one visit to the next. But oftentimes, our patients with CTCL have small lymph nodes with relatively low uptake. One important point with PET scanning is that if there's a new lymph node or an area that suddenly has a very high uptake, this would trigger us to do a biopsy of that area to rule out large cell transformation which can occur in a small subset of patients. When you obtain all of these different measures from the blood, the skin, and the CT scan or PET scans, we can get a global assessment. And this is important for us as we think about what our next therapy is going to be. Many of our treatment regimens require weekly or bi-weekly therapy. So in that case, we would want to try to do a physical exam of the skin every month and flow cytometry every one to three months, depending on the patient's level of blood involvement. Then I try to do a global assessment and repeat imaging every three months, because even if a patient with mycosis fungoides or sesame syndrome is progressing in one compartment, they may actually be responding in other compartments, or they may not have been on therapy long enough to achieve their maximum response. It's important to remember to repeat biopsies during the course of treatment, particularly in patients who appear to have a progression of disease, or the appearance of new lesions, or lesions that are different from those that we saw at the start of therapy. There are multiple degrees of blood involvement in MF and Cesare syndrome. The ISCL has developed criteria for blood involvement that quantitate the amount of blood involvement based on the number of circulating malignant cells per microliter. Patients with B0 have effectively no blood involvement. B1 is a very broad category of low-level blood involvement. I tend to perform flow cytometry in B1 patients about every three months. It's important to continue following the blood in B1 patients because those patients may in fact progress to B2, which is an indicator that the disease is becoming more aggressive. 
In patients with B2 blood involvement, I assess blood involvement monthly because blood involvement is one of the major compartments driving disease progression. Regular blood monitoring, even in early stage MF, is a critical component of our assessments as patients with patches and plaques can still have some degree of blood involvement. The blood component of the disease is very important to me when I think about my treatment decisions. For instance, if a patient has a significant circulating population, we need to make sure that our therapy of choice is directed to those circulating cells as well as to the skin. This is particularly relevant for the earlier stage patients who might be treated with ultraviolet light therapies or perhaps in other instances, radiation therapy. Certainly those therapies are very effective to clear the skin, but they don't really affect the circulating component of the disease. So it's important to identify early on which patients have blood involvement. Few of our patients who present with early stage MF will continue to have early stage disease indefinitely. Many patients have the disease for 10, 15, or 20 years or longer, and they'll undergo a stage-wise progression. So if you follow up, you may in fact see progression from T1 to T2. These patients can also develop tumors or there can be progression in the blood with increasing number of circulating cells. It's more common to see mycosis longoides and sensory syndrome progression in lymph nodes, but other organs such as the spleen, the liver, or other visible sites may also become involved. Of course, involvement of other organ sites is rare and it tends to occur with more aggressive disease, but any patient with mycosis longoides could progress over time to more advanced stages. In many cases, a dermatologist will be the first physician to make the diagnosis of mycosis fungoides. If the disease is limited, they may initially treat patients with light-based therapies, topical therapies, or perhaps an oral agent. The dermatologist is also likely to diagnose patients with sensory syndrome. Because sensory syndrome is more advanced, I would recommend that these patients be referred right away. Some dermatologists may not have access to the tools that are necessary for the diagnosis of systemic disease, such as flow cytometry testing or CT or PET staging. So this is where it's important to be in a multidisciplinary setting. In our cancer clinic, many of our patients have tremendous needs in multiple different compartments. Multidisciplinary care is recommended, in fact, by the NCCN guidelines to optimize quality of life and the medical management of this disease. In our center, we collaborate with a number of physicians and teams to provide the best care for our patients. With mycosis fungoides and the Cesare syndrome, this includes dermatologists, hematologic oncologists, radiation oncologists, bone marrow transplant specialists, psychosocial support providers, wound care specialists, pharmacists, palliative care specialists, pathologists, and nurse practitioners. Once a patient with mycosis fungoides or Cesare syndrome comes to our oncology clinic, we continue to collaborate with our dermatology colleagues in the overall management of that patient. This is particularly important when a patient has persisting skin issues. We often collaborate on the same visit day and compare notes to discuss how our patient is doing and whether we feel that a patient is progressing. The dermatologist can help with management of different skin symptoms and their treatment using modalities such as ultraviolet light therapy that we may want to integrate into our overall care plan. Caregivers are really important in the management of mycosis fungoides and the Cesare syndrome. They're oftentimes the first ones to notice changes in their loved one's condition. 
they usually field all of the questions and concerns at home that we don't hear about in the clinic. And in many instances, the caregiver is involved with the actual skin care, so they need to learn how to apply the different creams and dressings. I like to spend some time with caregivers to hear their concerns, as well as those of our patients. And I think that getting that caregiver input is critical in a multimodality context where we're trying to manage all aspects of the disease. Indication. Potoligio Mogamulizumab KPKC injection for intravenous infusion is indicated for the treatment of adult patients with relapsed or refractory mycosis fungoides, MF, or Cesare syndrome, SS, after at least one prior systemic therapy. Important safety information, warnings and precautions. Dermatologic toxicity. Monitor patients for rash throughout the course of treatment. For patients who experienced dermatologic toxicity in trial one, the median time to onset was 15 weeks with 25% of cases occurring after 31 weeks. Interrupt Podoligio for moderate or severe rash, grades two or three. Permanently discontinue Podoligio for life-threatening grade four rash or for any Stevens-Johnson syndrome, SJS, or toxic epidermal necrolysis, 10. Infusion reactions. Most infusion reactions occur during or shortly after the first infusion. Infusion reactions can also occur with subsequent infusions. Monitor patients closely for signs and symptoms of infusion reactions and interrupt the infusion for any grade reaction and treat promptly. Permanently discontinue Podoligio for any life-threatening grade four infusion reaction. Infections. Monitor patients for signs and symptoms of infection and treat promptly. Autoimmune complications. Interrupt or permanently discontinue Podoligio as appropriate for suspected immune-mediated adverse reactions. Consider the benefit risk of Podoligio in patients with a history of autoimmune disease. Complications of allogeneic HSCT after Podoligio. Increased risk of transplant complications have been reported in patients who received allogeneic HSCT after Podoligio. Follow patients closely for early evidence of transplant-related complications. Adverse reactions. The most common adverse reactions reported in greater than or equal to 10% of patients with Podoligio in the clinical trial were rash, including drug eruption, 35%, infusion reaction, 33%, fatigue, 31%, diarrhea, 28%, drug eruption, 24%, upper respiratory tract infection, 22%, musculoskeletal pain, 22%, skin infection, 19%, pyrexia, 17%, edema, 16%, nausea, 16%, headache, 14%, thrombocytopenia, 14%, constipation, 13%, anemia, 12%, mucositis 12%, cough 11%, and hypertension 10%. You are encouraged to report suspected adverse reactions to Kiowa Kieran Incorporated at 1-844-768-3544 or FDA at 1-800-FDA-1088 or fda.gov slash medwatch.